was a dark and stormy night Nor'easter rolling in It's a long 12 hours The power's out again I pray for inner strength And that we don't lose no lives Just another day in the first responder's eyes Half a cup of coffee's gone The first run comes in A car slid off the road There's a family trapped within My heart beats like a hammer I can barely catch my breath I'm thinking the worst and hoping for the best difference and the first on every scene it's a heavy heavy burden to carry all this burden when you can't unsee the things you've seen it keeps going on when those sirens are gone Hey, welcome to the award-winning Mad Radio Show with Sam and John. Hey, Sam. Hey, how are you? Just making sure we are up and running here on the social media. Oh, yeah. It looks great on on, uh, on the pages right now. Uh, I know we had some wind problems and some storm problems <laughs> come through Texas. Uh, I hope everything on your end is okay. Uh, we did a lot of cleanup today um put some lawn furniture back where it's supposed to be and um yeah it's still blowing about the gusts of 45 so um hopefully the the wind the wind gods will be with us tonight and we won't have any weirdness going on with our awesome. Awesome. but it's been uh it's been just like the weather's been wild it's been a wild time for our law enforcement officers out there um specifically as you know um, or maybe people don't know. I, we got a border crisis going on and yeah. a lot, uh, a lot happening with our law enforcement down there. Uh, the reports are not good despite if you're watching mainstream media, I'm just saying the reports from the actual officers are things are not good. So whatever news organization you choose to listen to, you may not be getting the full story. Um, they don't feel safe. They're not getting uh, direction from uh, command. And it is a very confusing time. Uh, I feel like we're handling, uh, for all intents and purposes, a refugee crisis. Local PDs, even the guy, guys and gals in DHS, they're talking about now dispatching Secret Service down there. Um, it, no, it's not the way it's supposed to go. Dallas police off the Dallas PD is now on, uh, on alert that we may be receiving 3000, uh, yeah. young people being yeah. housed at, uh, K Bailey Hutchinson's, uh, the conference center folks make no mistake about it. Law enforcement continues to be caught in the middle of this. The politics surrounding this are ugly um, and nobody seems to be able to get a straight answer. So like, like we end the show, you know, I always start my day just getting up, praying for all the first responders everywhere that are trying now to keep us safe, our borders safe. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, they threw open this, uh, the South, the South Gate, and a, and this this flood of uh, the immigration flood is coming in, um, in in droves every day, which is taxing, really putting uh, us putting our border patrol officers in such stressful positions. Their interactions daily have uh, have raised over a thousand percent, which makes it even more dangerous. Um, you know, for some of the people, you know, some of the people that are trying to get over into our, our country and coming through our borders are, you know, innocent 
uh, families trying to make for a better life, but there are some very shady characters that are also trying to, to make their way into our country, which puts our Border Patrol officers in very high-risk situations. Um, and it's only a matter of time before something goes south real soon. And I, I really, um, I hate to say that because if you're looking across the nation, and, and I'm sure you see it all the time, Sam, too, uh, you know, with social media, we hear more and more about the police shootings and the cops being shot um, on routine things. We had a, a cop shot in a, in a, you know, in a, I think it was a JC Penney's for a shoplifting incident. Mm -hmm. We had a SWAT, we had a SWAT officer shot the other day. We've had a couple more cops shot around the country every day. Uh, people have, are now, um, feeling that it's okay to pull a gun on a police officer and, uh, challenge him. And, um, I don't, I don't know where, why society has been like this. It's never been this way um, where we think it's okay to, to fight against our, our laws. But um, I, I pray to God every day for our first responders out there, paramedics, firefighters uh, yeah. as, as well, because, you know, firefighters are being uh, fired upon too, getting randomly shot at. Paramedics are being robbed and beaten for drugs that they think they're, they're carrying on the ambulances. So I think we've, we've seen such a, a time where the crisis in America between for our first responders is at a all time risky business uh, high. And God, I, I pray for these guys every single day. Yeah. You know, you said, you said the word crisis and um, crises plural come in. They, well, we've got a lot of them going on. They look different. One, you know, the topic of tonight's show is uh, another hot topic as it comes to policing because we are also in the midst of all this. Let's not forget we have de the defund the police going on. Correct. So we've got a national crisis. We've got a border crisis. Uh, we've got mental health crisis inside our law enforcement um, front lines, the, the men and uh women that serve in our first responder community as a whole. And tonight we are, we have a really very cool guest on. Um, this, this gentleman is not uh, foreign to a camera, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> yeah, used to having cameras uh, recording his every move um, and, uh, he is, uh, Ernie Stevens of Ernie and Joe, the crisis cops. We are talking about how to effectively, uh, handle, um, the mental illness, uh, or mental unwell that we have in our communities and dealing with the public, which is, which is different. We are going to talk about how it, how it definitely affects us as uh, first responders. And what I want to do is uh, want to introduce Ernie. Uh, Ernie is a now retired San Antonio police officer. He was born and raised in San Antonio. He's been married for 16 years, has two incredible children. He started his law enforcement career in 1992 when he joined the Terrell Hills Police Department and he transitioned into the San Antonio Police Department in 1994. Ernie has been assigned to a wide variety of units throughout his 28 year career, helping him gain a deeper understanding of the unique struggles police encounter on a daily basis. He has served with patrol DWI unit, tactical response unit, field training, and was uh, ended his career um, assigned to the mental health unit where he did 12 years and uh, it, it just a fantastic uh, documentary with that showing what, what Ernie did. He was one of the founding members of SAPD's mental health unit where he pioneered inner innovative training to provide law enforcement with a deeper understanding of citizens living with a mental health diagnosis and the real world skills necessary to assist them. Ernie is an advanced instructor and has been certified by the FBI uh, hostage negotiation teams. Ernie has served as board director for NAMI. We're familiar with, uh, with those great folks in the early 2000s. 
He holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and is currently enrolled. Hey, did you finish grad school? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Is that how we start this interview? Wow. We'll what, wow. What, what, uh, he's been uh, the subject of several documentaries, including the HBO's award-winning Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, NBC's A Different Kind of Force, and coverage on ABC's Nightline. He is dedicated to continuing the effort to find better ways for law enforcement and the community to connect with each other. Yay, communication, what a concept. Ernie, welcome to the show. Welcome, Sam, John, thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor to be here. You know, I just wanna, I just wanna, I gotta, I gotta start this off with, you know, you're such a mom, Sam. I'm <laughs> such a mom. <laughs> yeah, because you were, you were like this really cool guest and then you, then you scolded him for not completing grad school. <laughs> well, it was more of a question because we'll get into the documentary where, you know, while he was a police officer, he was uh, in school. So <laughs> no, I just 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 try to make light. But of I guess it. I trying to make light of it. So I guess that's I guess that's good that it's kind of it's kind of coming out because that mom part of me. Uh, has been absent, you know, for a long time, especially the, with the stresses of, of work and of law enforcement. And so now that I've been separated uh, from service for for a bit, uh, able to calm down. And I'm glad to show the mom side of me. So yay, moms. Well, it's coming out. It, it's definitely it's definitely resonating. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Good, good, good. Well, Ernie, I, I got to tell you, uh, if it's okay, we're going to jump like we're going to jump in head first here because first of all, folks, if you don't have HBO, go get it like free for a month or whatever your free trial is so that you can uh, watch Ernie and Joe crisis cops from the minute the show started. Uh, I was surprised um, I have to say, I, I went into uh, my analytical self. My husband was watching the documentary with me. Lots of questions back and forth, pausing, re restarting, rewinding, going over it again. Um, from the minute the show starts, you all talk about how you're criticized for poor tactics. And I, no joke. I'm watching it. My husband walks in and he's like, why are they sitting down with this guy? <laughs> and I was like, just, you know, I was like, just honey, just, just let it play out. You're coming in. I'll rewind. I'll show you because as police officers, when we're called by uh, our community to respond, it's not, it's not the typical thing to sit down with a person um, who in, in the case of, of what was going on, and I'll set the scene without, you know, ruining the movie for everybody, but that was, um, had some concerning behavior going on, was frightening others in the, uh, in the courtroom, the, the area that he was in. And you all came in, you sat down and there's two folks for all law enforcement. There's always two. It's not like a one-on-one, -on -one. two people. So one's watching the hands. Uh, and that's why I was picking you guys apart tactically. <laughs> um, but the way you came in and completely diffused a situation where we have seen countless times it just go from bad to worse, the volatility, the aggression. Um, clearly this gentleman needed assistance and you were there to, to provide it. Take us through how you were able to do that successfully. I'm just gonna shut up and let you talk now. <laughs> well, I, I think importantly, you know, we understand what we're dealing with, right? Um, Joe and I've been doing this job in mental health for a very long time. Uh, we've been on thousands and thousands of mental health calls where these are the most psychotic individuals that this city has to offer. Right. But we know what we're walking into. Now, do we understand that there's an element of danger? Absolutely there is. But how much of that danger is really 
driven by stigma. A lot of it is, right? Somebody that has a mental health crisis, why are we treating that any differently than maybe somebody that's going into a diabetic shock? They're both a medical emergency, are they not, right? So we understand that. And we understand that people with mental health diagnoses are more likely to be a victim of crime, right, than to be a criminal themselves. So we understand the behaviors. Uh, we understand the importance of de-escalation and active listening. And we understand the importance of not focusing on so much the problem, but more on the person. And if we focus more on connection instead of correction, we're going to be able to do those tactical compromises, I like to call them, right? Because if you ever go up and shake somebody's hand, is that not a tactical compromise, right? Because police officers, we don't shake hands, we don't touch, we don't, we don't hug, we don't cry, right? But we do because we're human beings and we have emotions as well. So I think in order to capture the essence of what we do day to day in this unit is understanding that we really need to try to make a connection with the individual that's in crisis. And the only really way to do that, Sam, is by being authentic and by being vulnerable ourselves. And I think knowing that going in is what gives us an advantage of, of making a building good rapport with somebody. Now, when did you all see the need to go to the chief and say, hey, you know, chief, we really need a unit that's dedicated uh, to the mental health of the folks in our community and how to effectively um, deal with them. Yeah, so I'm glad y'all are sitting down for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the training that Houston put on in 2003, and then we had a an individual from the community, a member of NAMI, a mom, came and talked about her son that has schizophrenia. And, you know, she made a profound statement. She said, one day one of the officers might have to show up to my house and my son's behavior is going to scare you. And you might actually end up shooting him. And I just want you to go home safe to your family. So when she said, when she made that statement, that impacted me as a, as a parent, as a member of this community, I'm thinking to myself, well, why don't we have something in place to help her? Because she is resolved to the fact that this is gonna be the outcome if she calls the police. And that's sad, right? That is sad to think my only recourse when I need the police might be a negative outcome. So with her passion and her story, that drove me at the time I was in a tactical unit, uh, the tactical response unit, which is all the sexy in policing, right? All the, the kicking down doors, chasing cars, drugs, guns, money, gangs. And that statement, my career path took a 180 and, and it became all mental health 24 seven at that point. And um, I thought, hey, let's approach the chief. I've got a brilliant idea that I want to start a mental health unit. The problem in is in policing, and John, I'm sure Sam can also attest, you're only allowed to be as smart as your rank. So if it's not <laughs> leadership, <laughs> if it's not the idea of leadership, your idea is not going to get very far. So what I realized very quickly was the fire department doesn't come unless there's a fire, right? So I joined NAMI. And NAMI really became the catalyst um, in, in getting the chief to sit down and meet and talk about the importance and the need of a specialized unit, like a mental health unit. We're the seventh largest city in the United States. Why don't we have this? And, um, you know, with a little bit of pressure from the community, he's like, hey, I know the perfect person for this unit. And that's how we got started uh, December 2008. You know, you... And you, you approached this back in 2003, which was a tough time because we, would do, we weren't even scratching the surface on mental health back then. We were, we were still treating um, mental health uh, uh, calls as almost criminal. You know, I, I know we did that in New York a lot where uh, mental health wellness uh, were almost a criminal call where you would go there, high tactics, everything up, and... Um, you know, with no de-escalation in, in, in mind. And so you had a real uphill battles in 2003 and two, even 2008 as well. Still still very um, young on the mental health areas in, in law enforcement and first responders. Yeah. And John, to no far fault of our own in law enforcement, we just didn't know any better. Right. right. We were doing... Right. We were doing like you're describing at the opening of the show. We're just putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole and hoping it holds, right? With like immigration, same thing we were doing for mental health. 
Richard's hoping, hey, let me put a Band-Aid on this and hope I don't get called back because I really don't know what to do. I know how to arrest somebody, right? Um, I'm good at that. So who were who was the largest um, mental health facility in a lot of states? It was your jails, right? Right. For a long time and still are, unfortunately. So, you know, with the development of the mental health unit and seeing the ports of it and increasing the training, what we saw was a, a couple of pendulums really swaying. Uh, one was a decrease in the population in the jail for misdemeanor arrests that included mental health. And number two, as the number of officers went up, they got the training, the use of force went down. So you can say it's correlation causation based on the definition of, of use of force at the time. I would like to think it's the training myself. Yeah. Now, is this training that you're talking about uh, as part of the documentary, you talk about how, you know, 60 plus hours. I mean, it's constant with tactical training with firearms and stuff like that. I mean, at that time, you only had eight hours of call it communications uh, and mental health training. When you went to the chief, how much training did you realize you needed, you know, A, to even bring the idea to the chief, then continue on with the training and creating a curriculum that actually would make a difference in the department? I love your question, Sam. So in the beginning, I went and took the 40 hour course based on the Memphis model that they created in Houston. Now I had to bring that curriculum back and structure it based on the resources that we had in our community, right? Because there's some classes that are foundational that you wanna to stick to. You wanna make sure that it's officer led but community supported. And what I mean by that is bring in your subject matter experts to teach you know, different personality disorders, the different diagnoses, because it does no good for a police officer to go up there and try to talk like a doctor, right? It's just not gonna, it's not gonna work. Really? <laughs> and then, and then number three, the chief asked for 10% of the department to get trained and he wanted volunteers because when you volunteer for a training, you know, you're going to get officers that want to do that particular line of work or want that particular line of training. Well, then in 2010, he mandated the entire department get trained. So 2,300 officers mandated or being voluntold, they have to do this, which created a whole nother issue in itself because we had officers that would have rather just retired than taking this hug a thug type training, right? <laughs> I mean, really, that's what it came down to. Right, right, right. Okay, you know, so, oh, yeah, no. go ahead, John. I was going to talk about uh, <clears throat> when you talk about the different personality disorders. Um, you brought up schizophrenia, um, where you don't know where where that individual is going to go. Um, so a lot of lot of uh, officers fear for their lives because they they have a they don't have a, the knowledge or the training of what that mental illness is all about. You know, when you hear schizophrenia, you think, oh, my God, they have multiple personalities. They can come out with, you know. And I, I think when we don't understand the mental um, the mental disease, we can't treat that person effectively you if we don't understand it. it. Yeah. So with knowledge comes power, right? So what the officers had to learn was what is mental illness? What is mental health, first of all? And it's a spectrum, right? We all have mental health. Just some of us do better than others in some days, right? Um, but with that, there are different types of illnesses that present different ways. And we're not doctors. We're not trying to get the officers to diagnose, but we're trying to get them to recognize and also understand that people are all different, right? Some people that are depressed may look angry and not know how to express that, especially in adolescents or juveniles. They haven't learned how to really express their emotions, so they compartmentalize and it manifests as anger. Whereas in an adult, it may be you disconnect and just shut down and go into your little shell and don't wanna to talk to anybody, right? So it's important that we bring in the correct people, the doctors, to come in and say, this is what a borderline personality looks like. This is what bipolar disorder looks like. This is what happens when you have schizophrenia and bipolar, right? And then the important part of this is we get the we get the students out of their seats after they've learned this, and we get them into role plays. And the role plays are conducted by licensed professional counselors or social workers from our local mental health authority, because that's all they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So they really know how to, to dial into these types of roles and get the officers to try to mimic 
what they learn downstairs in an actual crisis situation. That way we have wow. a way to gauge if they understand this. And, you know, for the officers that come in skeptical, you know, with a lot of training, you go out on the street and you try it and it works. The program will sell itself. I don't have to go up here and try to sell the program, you know. Yeah. Do you the, uh, the role plays, the role plays were incredible. I mean, I'm watching it. You, you covered everything from a veteran uh, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and beyond with uh, a, a, um, a mental illness. You also covered, you also covered children in these role plays and the uh, the officers that you highlighted that were doing the role play and um, it, it, the the mental health professionals that were in the room that I I saw I saw that these officers first of all all wanted to be there they all realized they were like a fish out of water but they had the desire to learn and that came across nobody was. Um, you know, trying to not accept the the uh, critiques of it, they all wanted to understand how to make the situation better. And I'll go back to when you the the scene number one in that documentary of, and this is what I I think that every officer should see is the quintessential young person with a mental illness stuff broke bad really fast all he has is a screwdriver in his hand he wasn't being aggressive and the next thing you know he's he shot multiple times and he's down and it's it's just like i i you know i've been separated from law enforcement for a while but not long enough to look at that and say at every fiber of my being, there is no way that that should have gone down like that. Yeah, and so I'll go back to <clears throat> one of your statements that you made earlier about the officers look like they were accepting the critiques. And that's because one of the topics that we cover is officer suicide, right? And that's one of the role plays they didn't show in the documentary, which I wish they would have, is we actually have an officer go in that's contemplating suicide, right? Based on a, a crisis. And we, you know, in the nation last year, 239 officers committed suicide, according to bluehelp.org, right? Where 45 died in line of duty by, by assault. So we're killing ourselves at a rate of four to one. And during the documentary, we had three officers in our department commit suicide in a 16 month period. So it's time to take this subject very serious uh, because if we're not well ourselves, how good are we going to do at communicating right with the community. So I think because we touch on that subject and run a role play on, on Wednesday with that, what you were looking at was the Friday role plays in the documentary. They they were already keyed in to this is why it's important because we've had, yeah. we've buried our own, right? Because we didn't know, we didn't know to ask. Um, now transitioning back to the opening scene of the film. And for those that have not seen the film yet, I do want to put that caution out that there is a violent scene at the very beginning. So if that's a trigger, I want you to be aware of that. We always encourage people to watch the documentary in groups and you can discuss it. Um, but, you know, we were shown that clip during ABC Nightline's filming. And it's one of those where you hate to Monday morning quarterback anything, right? And I spoke to an officer from Dallas who gave me a little bit more background. He said, you know, we've been there over 30 times. This individual has been aggressive in the past. So they had a little bit more history and information than I did based on just this video clip that I saw that uh, the media showed us. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I look at the body language. I study body language. I'm a huge fan of Joe Navarro and his body language. And um, yeah, you're right. I don't want to, I don't want to upset anybody by what I say, but if you understand body language and you understand the concept of, of distance and de-escalation, maybe that could have turned out a different way. Can I jump in real quick on that, Ernie? I just want to touch on that because that scene with the screwdriver, and like I said, I, I only got to see about 30, the first 30 minutes of the film. Um, the scene with the screwdriver, and then you guys, um, you and Joe almost approached the same exact scenario, but the guy's holding a pen, right? Yeah. And it got this de-escalated in a different manner. Now you talk about this, the guy with the screwdriver, they've been to his house over 30 times. 
right? Right. How was he treated on the first, second, third, and fourth? Was maybe he was frightened of those Fifth, offers? Six, right? seven, so, right? <laughs> so here, here's here's what my my, my thing is um, is that well maybe that guy that guy was treated poorly and he and he was fearful of the police, you know, yeah. and maybe when they came to him. He was fearful all 30 times. Maybe that first interaction with the cops made him fearful. So that's why they constantly had violent. Um, and like I said, not Monday morning quarterbacking, but, an, you know, you know, first impressions count. And especially yeah, with somebody. So, so I want to, I love that you say that first impressions count because the very next scene we transition to in the documentary is the footage in the courtroom. And we show up in plain clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's how we that's how we roll down here, man. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're in a pair of jeans and a polo. And if it's a hot day, I'm in a T-shirt. Um, but because you and I both know, we all know on this, your first use of force is your mere appearance. So if you're showing up and look how officers dress nowadays, how mm -hmm. many of them have the outer carry vest? Yep. They tuck their hands under here and they got all the magazines and the handcuffs and the zip ties. And it can, it looks scary. It looks scary. Yeah, yeah. Right. And especially if you're in a crisis and you're paranoid on top of that, whether it be drug induced or mental health. Right. So just your mere appearance, your first impression can really make or break what's going to happen, you know, throughout this next part of trying to build rapport. Um, you know, and then once we realized, yeah, he had a pen, we had distance. I was actually cover in that scenario. Joe was going to be the primary. And, um, you know, we have lethal force if we need it. Um, we just, by the grace of God, we've never had to use it. And, but that pin was a tactical compromise, but we also told him, can you leave it here and walk out with this? But this see, you, exactly and, and that's, and that's what I focused on in, in the, the part of that film was when you approached him, you didn't meet, I mean, you noticed the pen, you took, you took note of it, but it wasn't that you walked up and said, Hey, drop that pen. You didn't come off aggressive. Right. And, and, and tell him to drop what he had in his hands. You introduced yourself. You made a connection. Then, almost on a friendly basis, you were like, hey, can you just leave that pen here? And it was no problem. Yeah. You know, so another officer without the training, without the knowledge, without without a, um, with any background of mental health uh, may walk up and, and automatically focus, instead of on a person, focus on that pen as a threat and automatically become aggressive and go, drop the pen. Now you've started off that you've started off that um, interaction very poorly. You yeah, know, so no, I think yeah. you guys handle it amazing. Yeah, and thank you, John. And a lot of that, you know, and our our verbiage may change based on the scenario, right? I've had individuals holding a knife where I've had a lot of distance, but I make it, I draw a line in the sand, and I say, look, I want to help you, and I want you to help me understand. But as long as you're holding that knife, I can't talk to you. And I'm, I have a feeling you have a lot of important things that you want to share with me. And I'm willing to be, you know, to, to listen to you. I just need you to put that down. Nobody's going to hurt you. Nobody's going to take it from you. We just want to communicate. Right. So you do have to understand, you know, that there are some viable threats out there where, you know, you just can't let yourself get sucked into these scenarios because you want to help so bad. There's still a, a tactical um, safety issue involved where I got to make sure Joe goes home to his uh, right. to his family and all 50 of his kids or whatever he's got now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother documentary. That's a whole nother story, man. <laughs> Joe has 50 um, kids. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he's going to make sure I get home to mine. So that's why, you know, we, we do take tactics serious. Although you look at the film and you're thinking, what are these guys doing? <laughs> well, but, and it's, you know, um, John and I talked earlier today and yes, taking tactics Seriously, you know, that is that is the difference between life and death with, in, in police work. Um, the way you guys broke down, not the lack of tactics, but it's focusing on the person, not making sorry, my my dog is in the background. Is this a Christmas episode? I know, right? Here comes Santa. <laughs> you see. Um it, and the, the whole scene that you, you set up with, okay, here's the scenario. You've got a person in the car with a gun. And now it's what, in that situation, what do 99% of police officers focus on? The gun. Yeah. We got it. It's not, 
It's not person who may be mentally uh, ill, actually person we know who's mentally ill because we've been told, we have corroboration that that is in fact the case, but because they have the gun, they are seen as an object, not as a person, and we must diffuse gun first. And talk, talk a little bit about how you've got to flip that in a mental health crisis situation. Yeah, and so that's difficult in the in the part in the film, you know, where where you had to to deal with a lady that was it was a it was a tactical nightmare, right? She's outside in between two cars holding a gun to her head, and it's nighttime. And it's not like she did this to say, "Hey, look at me, I need attention." She waited till her husband and kids went to bed, and then she came outside to do this. So, you know, you you get there and you got all these officers. It looks like call of duty lined up with, you know, every kind of rifle, shotgun, shield. You know, one guy had a Ram. It was like, man, she's outside. Why do we need a Ram? What's going on here? They were so focused on the tactical dangerousness of this one person that had a gun that wanted to kill her oneself. Right. But nobody ever tried to reach out to her, the person, nobody tried to contact her and even speak to her. The plan was already, well, let's form an echelon and march down there and start yelling commands. Well, hold on. Can't we slow down and try to communicate with her and talk to her? And that's exactly what happened. Joe made a phone call. She answered. And um, he was able to de-escalate using everything that we teach about active listening. And, you know, her. And what I love about it is, you know, in part of the documentary, we say for officers, have you ever told anybody on a call? Hey, I'm scared. You know, officers don't say that. Like we're taught to be hard. We're taught to be tough. We don't ever say we're scared. But to be honest, if you've been on this job for more than 10 minutes, have you not been scared? Like walking up on a traffic stop is scary. Searching a building is scary, right? This job has some scary moments, but we're taught not to show it, put our mask on and hide behind that. Well, in this case, once he told her, look, you've got me scared, Brenda. I'm nervous. Like, I'm scared. I'm scared of what's going to happen. You know, and her response was classic. Well, I'm not trying to scare you. What do you want me to do? Well, I simply want you just to put your gun down. Somebody, some tackleberry is watching you with binoculars, right? And I just want you to walk to me and I'm going to meet you. And we're just going to talk. Nobody's going to tackle you or handcuff you. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, but you had to pump the brakes on that and get above and kind of look down from 30 feet, 30,000 feet up and look down and look at the entire picture of what was going on. But officer hears gun, and that's all they're responding to. And they're thinking, oh, gun, here we go, you know? And it's like, no, person, person with a gun. We're gonna deal with the gun and stay safe, but we've got to deal with the person that's in crisis. Yeah. Do you think, and, do you think it's ahead. more of a patience, um, a patience issue that a lot of patrol, a lot of patrol officers do not have the patience because they, you know, they're so they're so amped up. They're going from one job to the next to the next. You know, it's almost it's almost like a, um, you know, a cattle call line. Let's get this one in. Let's get it out. Let's get. So to be able to take the time and actually talk to somebody and to communicate with somebody, they just want to, boom. Let's get this done. Let's get them in cuffs. Get them in a the car. Go to the next call. You know. That, so, yeah, that's that's exactly it. And how do you how do you build rapport with somebody that way? You can't. You, know, you can't. can't. Yet we train every year. We have to qualify with our firearm. We have to spend a whole day at the range shooting, right? We've got to practice our tactics day, whatever that includes. But how much time do we really train every year in just learning how to talk to somebody or critically think? Because is that not 99% of what your day is going to be is having citizens encounters with somebody that's in some type of crisis that's lost the ability to cope with the situation yeah. and just need you to help them recenter themselves. Right. And get oh, yeah. them back on track. So why don't we practice that a little bit more in the academies? Well, when I got on a job, when I got a job in New York and uh, back in 91, Giuliani brought in the CPOP uh, uh, community policing. And, you know, I was, I was in the, the one of the highest crime ridden uh, areas of Brooklyn. And, you know, when I first got there, all the cops were like, yo, it's the us against them mentality. You know, and as I I was walking a foot post, I wasn't in a patrol car speeding by the community at 30, 40 miles an hour and not interacting. I was walking a foot post on one of the most dangerous streets 
and I got to interact with people and speak with people on a, on a personal level. And, you know, it's much different when you're out of the car and speaking to them and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. And you realize that it's not an us against them. It's a fear. It's a fear of them. And it's a fear of us. We, we both have fear against each other. And that's what makes the interaction so hard. Yeah, the and public don't fears all, us. Yeah. And don't we, we all live them? in the same, yeah, we all live in the same community. Yeah. <laughs> How can it be us against them? Right. Right. Aren't we all supposed to be working together and in, in trying to solve community issues that we're, yeah. you know, that we're faced with? And that's why I think as you see this paradigm shift into a big call for procedural justice, which is, you know, nothing more fancy word than community um, service and policing, right? You're going to see, I think, I hope, um, and Chief Andy Harvey wrote a great book on this called Excellence in Policing. He was a chief out in Dallas. Um, you're going to see more better customer service based policing based on what you just said, John, of that community oriented policing mindset. And that's getting out and talking to people and finding out what's going on in the community. Do you do you trust us enough to tell us and can we prove to you that 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 authority and that power that you're giving us as a police officer? We're going to show you as a gift giving back to you exactly what we're going to do with that trust. Right. Correct. Yeah, so let's go in, let's uh, dive into a really hard question now. The chain of command, the higher ups, the politicians that are involved are in some cities not giving the police an opportunity to do just that. They are taking uh, patrol units, putting um, licensed social workers uh, or clinical health folks in. Uh, out there with our police officers and I, you know, watching the documentary and seeing what's possible and what should be a national model. Well, the rug just got pulled on out from underneath that, you know, that that's been chucked in the, in the dumpster for now, this whole mindset of, well, we can't train our police officers to be mental health and crisis experts. No, what you know? What we're not going to do that. We're going to cut the training back. We're going to slash or have our budget slash. Let's just get the the social workers out there. I, I, I first gut reaction from from you when you when you hear well, that. So to me, the first thing that comes to mind is vicarious liability, right? If this training is available and you're not providing that to your rank and file, are you not liable for this? Now, can you do a co-responder unit and be successful? I think in a lot of cases you can. Um, I just came out from um, Fort Collins, Colorado, where they do that. Now, they're, they're more of a rural area out there, um, but they work very closely with their local mental health authority. They ride together with an officer. The officer clears the scene for safety, and then the officer shuts up and gets out the way and lets the clinician do their job, right, which is not a bad response. But when I see what they did in Harlem and they said, hey, no police officers are going to respond to mental health crises, only social workers, then it takes me back to what happened in Seattle where a social worker responded by herself and was stabbed and killed. So you, when you develop these models, especially if you're trying to build sustainability, you gotta look at what is the best possible model out there. With us, what we did was we would have clinicians go to the scene, but not approach. We would go up, clear the scene, do a, a, an assessment ourselves, to say, you know, are they homicidal? Are they suicidal? Is there a presence of weapons? Is there an imminency of danger? If not, a hey, clinicians, come on up and let you do your assessment. And then you can help us navigate what's the best treatment facility we need to go to if we need to do an involuntary commitment. So you really have to look at what resources are in your community. In Fort Collins, are the clinicians actually riding with the officers? Yes. Now, to me, I mean, Sam have discussed this. Now, I like the way you just said it, where the clinician arrives, stays away from the scene, and the cops pull up. But if if uh, if they're riding one hundred percent with the, uh, the the officers, city officer gets a gun run, or if he gets a burglary in progress, now he's got to worry about the clinician as a third party, doesn't he? Well, in Fort Collins, the, that co-responder unit they only respond to the mental health calls, so they're not going to get something outside of that realm. Unless it's patrol saying, hey, we showed up to this disturbance, but it's actually mental health related. Can you all come over here? So but they're, they're not going to get runs to robberies 
or but they're still in a but they're still in a marked police car. They are. Okay, so, so they you see know something. Yeah, you know how many times you you know the shit magnet happens, <laughs> and you know you're, um, you're that guy, huh? <laughs> you're that yeah, and you you gotta respond or you know someone takes a shot at a police car. You know how many times have we seen these ambushes happen, and and they're and they're escalating across the nation. I I think putting personally, I think putting a, a a clinician in a marked police car or a patrol car is actually putting their life and the life uh, of the officers in danger because now yeah, they're going to protect about, somebody else. How about the the you know officer down call? You know they push the button, they respond. The clinician is trained in a certain way and when they the clinician sees enough the violence against officers you know i i could i could foresee there being an issue where you know we got to tend to the officer and the clinician be like wait but they might the person that did this might have a mental health issue so let me <laughs> let me go over here and then you got cops over here you got the mental, uh, the the uh, the clinician over there, and not not you know nothing's been safe you know deemed safe yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I I think you can control that with policies and procedures. I would think a lot of that. You know, my biggest concern is if you're riding one officer, one clinician. To me, that's a little dangerous because when you arrive on scene, you don't know how many people are going to be involved. Right? right. You're going to have to worry about your consumer or your patient. But now you also have to worry about the safety and protection of your clinician, right. along with anybody else that may be at the scene. When Joe and I would arrive, you know, we have each other and we can focus in and really de-escalate whatever we needed to do and then bring a clinician. And when we knew it was safe, but even at that point, there's still two of us at the scene. These co-responder units where you're seeing one officer and one clinician are usually because of manpower issues and they just don't have the manpower to double up officers and then have a clinician follow them out to calls. Yeah. yeah. Now I want to I want to focus on because you know you and Joe you don't need a clinician with you. The, Joe always. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So Joe. Well, I guess it depends how many Red Bulls that, that he drinks. <laughs> but um, the scene with the woman on the bridge. Um, that that just blew me away. Don't and give it away. I didn't see that part yet. I know. Well, sorry, John, I'm going to ruin it, this because it was so, you guys roll up and this woman is like ready to launch herself. She, her body position, she is over the railing, straddling it on both sides. The training, how many years of training had you guys had on with that? with that call? Well, up at that point, we had probably been on the unit at least 10 years and we had handled probably 25, 30 jumpers. But what was, what was a little, I guess, um, unsettling for me is we had just had somebody jump in front of us uh, about a month before that. And uh, it was when we put on a uh, harness, uh, the person had been up on the bridge for hours and had committed a murder and another aggravated assault, had shot themselves in the foot themselves and were bleeding very cold, been sitting up on this bridge for hours. And we knew at some point we were just going to have to make that approach. Um, problem was the individual had a cell phone and was getting updates from the news. And when he saw that his, his wife had been killed, um, that's when he just looked back at us and said, well, it's now or never. And then just jumped uh, before we could even get the harness attached to the door frame. Right. So with this one, you know, we, I wanted to approach this one slowly again, um, you know, again, my great tactics, I sit down, right? Sorry, John. Spoiler. On the curb, John. He sits down on the curb. I'm scared of heights, man. Like, like, front, like, in, front of a, like in front of a, a New York City bodega. He's just like, I'm just going to sit down. Yeah, somebody bring like, me a cup of chata or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm a little nervous around heights. So I probably couldn't have got any closer if I wanted to. But again, we, we know what we're dealing with. We know if we can slow our approach and show that we're non-threatening. What I like about that scene is we're working off duty that night and we're in uniform. Right. So that goes to show that if you slow down and practice the skills that you're taught in CIT training and you feel proficient with them, it can be done in uniform. Right. It took a little longer, I felt, because all she saw was two cops coming up and she just kept yelling, don't tase me. Right. Well, what does that tell you? Right. 
She's been probably had a negative, yeah, <laughs> she probably had a negative run in with the police in the past. So our uniform was working against us right off the bat. And I recognize that. And that's really one of the reasons I sat down. I wanted to show, hey, I'm more than 20 feet from you and I'm not a threat. So yeah. that's why I did what I did. And it was it, it was incredible to watch when when you sat down, what she was like focused on your tasers. You were like, I promise I'm, I'm we're not going to tase you. And then you said, hey, I'm scared because yeah. and then you explained to her why you were scared. And then you could see, I mean, now the camera is very far away. So as you're watching the documentary, you can't see her face but you can see her entire body language. Everything just started to relax. Yeah, it, it did. And so she, again, spoiler alert, John, she comes and sits down for a minute, right? I'm trying to talk to her, but she's so paranoid. She jumps back up, walks over to the bridge and gets ready to, to, to go again. And you hear J Joe say, no, 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 don't do that, not in front of us. And it started the dialogue again, right? Um, where she just kept hearing voices. And I love what Joe said, because she said, I'm broken. And I said, you know what? You might be broken, but you're fixable. You know, we're going to get through this. And, and she said, well, the voices are just telling me to jump. And then Joe said something. I loved it. He said, um, you know, Kendra, you're stronger than the voices. Yes, you are. And he instilled into her some self-confidence. And that's when I saw her leg come back down again. I thought we got her. We got her now. It's just a matter of time. So, um, but everybody's different and unpredictable. So you just never know. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate um, that, that that turned out. Yeah, that turned now, out let me ask from with that scene and spoiler alert, I didn't see it yet, but I will watch it. Um, do you feel that if maybe because um, me and Sam talk about the wrong words could throw somebody off a bridge, you know, instead of bringing them back? Do you think if that response was from untrained officers, that is that that circumstance would have been uh could have turned out much different. Well, I know it could have because um, we responded to a jumper one day that was calling and was on the phone with the dispatcher saying, hey, tell my tell my wife and my kids I love them. I'm going to jump. And the dispatcher, as we were arriving on scene, said, you don't want to do that. That's stupid. You know? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I could oh. hear him yelling, who, who are you calling stupid? I'm like, uh-oh. Um, oh. You know, we had to approach that and say, you know what? Hang up. It's you and I now. It's you and I, and you're going to be the one in charge of the conversation. So tell me what's going on. Right. And he's like, you're a dispatcher. You tell her I'm not scared. You tell her I'm not stupid. I'm like, I'll tell her whatever you want. You know, that's fine. But just I, it's hard to hear you with all the traffic. Can you just come over here and we'll communicate? And uh, so I know it can. The wrong word. Yeah. Be See, and yeah, the wrong word could really throw somebody off the edge. I mean, even if they take it out of context, like she's saying that, you know, I'm sure the dispatcher was saying, well, that's stupid. Don't jump. But right. he took he took it as you're calling me stupid. So even taking a, a simple word out of contents uh, can can have devastating of uh, yeah. results. And you know yeah. we, we teach that because you know a lot of people have a have a they always say okay right okay like after you say something okay and you know we tell them look be careful not to validate negative behaviors. If they're up there and they say, hey, I'm going to jump. And you're like, OK, yeah. like you're not yeah, you're not telling them it's OK, <laughs> but they're like, wow, you really care. Ah, you know, so, you know, we tell them, be very careful if you've got uh, phrases that you say over and over. Just try to get away from the I understands and the OKs and really just focus in and not worry about what you're going to say next. You know, listen to what they're saying and empathize with them. Yeah. Right. Make that right. connection. And now, this is gotta be, the, sorry, John, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say that. And with that. Because we are so conditioned into talking the way we talk, this training should be yearly, should be updated all the time, and it's got to be practiced, or we forget it, or we can't. Yeah, or we yeah. Won't they're use diminishing. It. They are diminishing skills, and we're we're fortunate in Texas, where you know we teach the forty hour block of CIT training to every cadet, but when they graduate, in order for them to get their next level of licensing, to get their intermediate license, they have to take what's called the Sandra Bland. 1850 course, which was named after Sandra Bland, who committed suicide in jail after being stopped by a state trooper. And that is all about de-escalation and, and recognizing mental health as well. So really, in any two-year period, you can have an officer that has 80-plus hours of mental health training. So I'm glad they take it serious here in Texas and mandate it. 
Okay. Yeah. So how how difficult when you're going through the the CIT training is is dealing is uh, handling the uh, suicidal situation of a first responder of your own part of that training? Yeah, it's it's difficult because with the young officers, you know, they walk in and they keep wanting to say, you know, sir or ma'am, uh, sir, we're here to help you, sir. And it's like, stop, like quit doing that. You know, and then I'll take them out to the memorial wall. I say, look up here. Look at the, all these officers that have died on this department. OK, they're not sir. They're not ma'am. They're our brothers and sisters up here. And we're going to we're going to treat them and talk to them as if they are. So stop all that. And let's start over. Right. Where the veteran officers, they come in. I say, look, if you recognize the officer, then you recognize them for the role play. And sure enough, they, they will normally recognize them and be like, hey, Phil, what's going on, man? Your your wife called and or whatever the scenario is. And, make, and it's just like that emergency tone button. You know, when you hit that emergency tone, how many officers come to your aid? A lot, right? This is the same thing. It's just they're hitting, they're hitting their emotional e-tone. And I'm not leaving them until I know they're safe. And that's the same kind of mindset we're trying to instill in the officers. Right now, part of what we do on the show is, you know, we're, we, we talk about the stigma that a lot of the that first responders are dealing with. And that's one of the big reasons they don't ask for help, whether they've seen it in uh, the media where, uh, you know, John and I had talked about this before, <laughs> classic case, NYPD, I need help, gun and badge, go home. Like, yeah. okay, I can only imagine how the conversation went. Goes home, didn't dawn on you that he might have a gun at home. And hours later, they find him. He completes no. suicide. Okay, well, I'm sure. so you've got all of these stories and examples of why I shouldn't ask for help. And then you've you've got your the forty hour incredible training that you do with cadets. And like, how do you how do you marry the two? And and I and it goes back to in the documentary. There there's a class that you're teaching. And there's, there's, you know, the fresh faces, and I say the salty faces, you know, the guys, you know, like me and John, we've been on for a while. Well, sorry, John, you more than me. I just want to know where in Texas, yeah. I want to, you know, I don't want to call this out, but Ernie, when you say the state of Texas, um, and I thought Sam was leading into a spot that, um, because I just, like I said, I just went through an issue um, where none of that, none of that training that you're talking about, and I live here in Texas, um, was was shown, was generated, was forthcoming uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, so and they had all the information. They and had, they had all the yeah, information they had all the information. Family. They took it yeah. to a different level. Um, and I was wondering when when you say Texas, where is this training being given? Is it giving being given to small departments? Or is it be, get, get being given to just like they say Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston, or are smaller departments uh, getting this training as well? Right. So when we talk about the CIT training, the 40 hour course, that's the Memphis model. That is the preferred gold standard that you want to try to follow. However, nationally, the average size police department is eight officers. So can you send, you know, an officer off to a 40? You just can't do it. Right. So what you right. do is you search and find on the internet through your state licensing facility here, it's t -Cole. Hey, what can I take that can check the box off that I've had mental health training? And in Texas, it's 16 hours with an eight hour refresher every um, every four years, right? But, so but that's all they're, yeah, that's all they're required to get. So they're, they're, required, they're required to take it. It's, it's flat out required. It's not. Right. That's then, the 16 hours. Is. Okay. So then in a scene like what happened with John, maybe John, maybe one officer from the way you told the story, maybe one officer had the training, listened he, to everybody that was telling him exactly what was going on with you. And then I don't know how the other person who outranked him, didn't have that training that completely said f that we're not taking him to jps which is what should have happened you're going to jail 
And that's what they did, you know. And I think you hit it right on the head, Sam, is that, like I said, there were 30 officers out in front of my house, all with uh, ARs and SWAT teams and a whole bit. And one officer is the one that called me brother. And it's funny you said that, Ernie. There's only one. Um, everybody else was screaming at me, um, commands and everything else. I had 30 different commands coming at me. So, but I think it was the upper command made those decisions. Oh, yes. And, I guarantee you they did. And they were not. And I think that's where the buy-in comes in at who knows what the upper command wanted or what their mindset was at that moment in time. They were sick. They they were sick that day of the 16-hour <laughs> training. Yeah. I mean, they, they can mandate their officers and rank and file to go to the training. I've only had one assistant chief come through the training. But when she did, there you go. she there said- you go. She said, this was the best training I'd had in 35 years. Had I had this 35 years ago, I'd be a totally different person today. So when yeah. we talk about stigma, Sam, getting back to what you were saying, and John, I'm sorry that happened to you, man. I'm no, sorry. that's it. it it's, I, it's I can't fun. even imagine. Yeah, I cannot imagine what, what you must have been going through. And if you ever want to talk offline, I'll make sure we do that. Um, Love it. Uh, and Sam, getting back to your point about stigma, what you're doing on your show right now is so important because – you've opened up the conversation about mental health, first responders and stigma, right? If, if I ask John, hey, do you wanna go bowling Tuesday night with me? And he says, man, Ernie, I'd love to, but I gotta go see my therapist. That should not shock my conscience, right? I should say, okay, cool, maybe next week. Instead, our officer's not going and saying, hey, did you know John sees a therapist? Right. I wonder what's wrong with him, right? right. So we, we really must do a better job at building a culture of wellness within our police departments. And it has to start when you're a rookie and it has to follow you through retirement. And there's a whole way to do it, but not a lot of departments are willing to step up and say, wellness is important. Look at your look at your um, recruiting pamphlets. What do you see when you open them? A SWAT member, a canine member, right? right? Where does it talk about in there that, hey, we've got a wellness program for you in place because we know that you could experience up to 188 traumatic events in 20 years, and we want to be there for you. That's the kind of training pamphlet or recruiting pamphlet I want to see. If I'm applying for a job, I don't care about SWAT and their dogs and all that crap. I want to know, are you going to be there for me when I need you? Let's start recruiting that way, and maybe we'll get a better, you know, instead of your live PD and cop people, you know, maybe we'll get actual recruits that want to help and serve their community. Yeah, you know, um, one of the, the the phrases that you guys use throughout the, the documentary, and, and I, I just love this, is I see you. Yeah, yeah that was Joe. Um, Joe did a TED Talk, and it's on YouTube. I encourage you um, to Google his name, Joe Smarrow, I see you. And really what it is is saying, you know, you don't have to lie to me, and you don't have to pretend with me because I see you. You know, you, you don't have to say you're okay when you're not because I, I'm authentically going to become vulnerable for you because I want you to see me as well. And when you do that, there's a connection that takes place because with the film, the film, the film, the HBO documentary is not a how to film. It's not a blueprint film. Right. It's a film on human connection and the power of that and what can be accomplished if you if you would just change your mindset, take off your mask become a human being when you're trying to help somebody else. And that's what the film's about. That's the essence of it. I yeah, love that. Almost, I always see that Ted talk. Yeah. yeah. I, it almost um, watching part, the part of the Ted talk that was, that was featured in the film and then replaying over in my head, all of the, uh, not only the role plays, but the, the real life that you guys were going through. The thing, the thing that connected for me with that, it's both me talking to fellow first responders and me talking to somebody who may be in crisis. You have to look at them that first as a person who is injured and that this could be your brother your sister, your mom, your dad, your uncle. It's it's take out that 
there's a young man who is a paranoid schizophrenic. You, you know, you know this, you have the information, young man, paranoid, schizophrenic. We've been here before. We've been here multiple times who is not being aggressive with the body language in any way with the young man's mom, right? Standing right there. Yeah. And the complete lack of consideration that went down in that, that for me as a mom yeah. and as I have a, a younger sister, I have nephews. I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't, I could not reconcile the, uh, the emotion and, and, and like I said, I don't like to Monday morning quarterback either, but I really, I couldn't reconcile like what, are, what are, I've been separated from the job for so long. What are you all I, 30 times to the house? I don't care. What are you all not seeing about this young man? Right. And you know, and I didn't want to go through this in the secret service. We do not have this training. Yeah. I mean, it's just like me as a human being. Yeah. What, what do you not see about this about this situation? How do you not empathize with the with the Kendra who's one foot off the you know, like she's gonna go? Yeah, and and I'll and I'll bring it home a little closer than that because in the film Joe talks about his own diagnosis, right, of PTSD and depression, right. So Joe. Um, Joe was going through a very difficult time, right? And at times he was my little brother where I had to look after him and make sure, hey, he had a bad night last night. He came to work. He didn't sleep. Uh, he's got a lot going on. I, I need to look out for him. And then there's days where he's my big brother. Hey, Ernie, you should go back to school and get your degree, right? But when I saw him get into treatment and he went to the VA and he started seeing a therapist, it was like a whole new person blossomed. Right. It's like, hey, who is this guy all of a sudden? He's charismatic. He's funny. He's connecting to people like I'm just going to start shutting up on these calls. And I mean, I don't know where this guy came from. It was like an overnight thing. Um, but that's that's because he recognized. Right. He recognized there was an issue there. He wasn't worried about what was going to be said. And what's funny was when ABC Nightline rode with us, they asked him and, and it's on YouTube. They asked him, have you ever had suicidal thoughts yourself. And he said, yes, I have. And more than once the next day I got called into the chief's office and they said, Hey, do you feel safe riding with him? We think he may need a fitness for duty. And I'm like, you're just now asking me this. Like he's talking about something that happened years ago and he's in treatment now and he's doing better. And he's not afraid to tell his story because he's hoping that if just one person sees this and gets the help they need, then maybe they won't think about suicide. But man, the stigma and the leadership was just like ready to pluck him away from me. And it was insane. So you make so many good valid points that, you know, can lead to a whole nother two hours of discussion. Yeah, well, we're definitely uh, in agreement where there has to be a, a uniform national standard. We are losing uh, police officers to suicide. We are seeing our police uh, officers and entire departments not know how to deal with mental uh, illness crisis uh, well at all. Um, yes, some better than than others. It's it's a whole culmination because when you look at the big picture, how you treat the members of the public, it is really, you, you can say, no, I'd never treat my brother or sister in blue like that. But you know what? You just, you just said exactly, right. you gave two scenarios of what is going on behind closed doors. There's that, well, I don't, I, I don't know. It's like, hey, you put on that uniform. It's the brotherhood, the sisterhood in blue, that thin blue line. And we've got to continue to walk it together. We can't decide one day because somebody said something, we're going to step off and violate a trust. Okay. You wouldn't want it to happen to you. We got to decide as men and women in first responder land that we can't do that to our own.
Yeah. And, you know, you know John, John said it earlier. He said it's a we against, you know, it's an us against them where you're acting like there is a line there. And then you just mentioned that thin blue line, but we should be on it together. There should not be, we shouldn't see a separation on the other side of that line, right? This line should be wavy and in all different shapes and directions, right? Because we're embedded in the community and better cops will make for better communities. Exactly. We just have to be well on the inside. And with what's gone on in the last 16 months in this nation, this is a hard profession to get into. Uh, I've talked to officers that said, you know what, I'd rather just park my car answer my calls and then come back to this parking lot because the minute I'm proactive, anything could happen. Yep. And I hate to see that mindset because we need good police officers. Uh, we need those that are out there being proactive and fighting against crime, but we also need to show legitimacy within our communities to show that we can be trusted as well. And we, well, need, um, we need the leadership to trust. Well, we need, court too. We need our court systems too, because a lot of cops are now afraid to be proactive we just had a grand jury indict an officer who was getting pushed and punched, and he 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 maced her. He uses pepper spray on her during an uh, during this incident, and the grand jury uh, indicted him on assault. It's ridiculous. Video video cam shows that she was pushing him and aggressively going after him, and he he de-escalated it by pepper spraying her. But the grand jury found that he is guilty of assault. And, you know, now we get a lot of young officers that are going to go, I'm not going to do anything. You're right. And, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to go to jail for doing my job or trying to protect myself. Yeah. It's a, so it's a tough it's, call for profession right now. If you're, it if is. you're thinking about getting into law enforcement right now, really consider the pros and cons and think about the type of officer you're going to be and, and definitely do something I never did. Think about self-care early on in your career. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I'm I'm paying the price for it in small ways, some bigger than others, because I wasn't prepared for what I was going to see in this career, and I didn't do a good job of protecting myself, so or my family. Let me add on to that too. Not only protecting yourself, um, if you're looking into a career in law enforcement, look at the department you're joining, because look at look at the membership that's on there, because you could switch from want, wanting to be that good officer and really be swayed into being a bad one. So like San Antonio has a being, is being proactive with the mental health capabilities. So you know that there are departments that cares. We have departments out here that we know uh, care about their mental health of their officers. So do some due diligence on the department that you want to join as well. Yeah, yeah so we're spreading, uh, I helped to uh, spread the word about the documentary last night to uh, our local uh, PD here. We, we happen to be in the same uh, location and uh, saw the chief. Um, so we're hoping to get into that department here soon to do some training. And um, he was very, uh, he had heard of you guys, but had not seen the documentary. And I said, it's worth the 90 minutes. Uh, and I hope that you'll be open to possibly bringing this to our town because, you know, every, every department uh, needs it. And it's not just for the health of our officers, it's for the health of the, the community. So um, Ernie, any any parting words to uh, everybody listening out there? Well, if you are interested in a screening and you're a police department or, you know, uh, really any organization, if you'll just reach out to ernieandjoethefilm.com, uh, the screenings are free. And they, the film director will be happy to bring that screening to your police department and then set up a Zoom. Um, hopefully me and Joe will both be available. We can come in and, and kind of talk about uh, the film and the establishment of mental health units. But, you know, what I want to just also say to, to your listeners is if you're a community member, you know, please don't give up on your police department. It's a tough job that they're trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm praying that, you know, this documentary is shown at every police academy and they see that the importance of the connection between the police department and the community, especially the needs of mental health uh, that we're seeing now in the United States. The pandemic caused all kind of, and is still causing all kinds of problems with mental health. And we just want to do the best job we can to be there for you and for you to be able to trust us. Great. And you said that's Ernie and Joe, the film.com. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Put you that know, up right now. And I, I was going to, I was going to ask you about the screening on the course because I saw on the website uh, right under the director's um, comments about you can request a screening. And Sam, I was actually going to bring this up to you that 
you know, we could probably get a, a smaller theater to host um, a law enforcement screening of the film here in Dallas. And, you know, instead of people going, so it, they'll say, oh, I don't, I can't, I don't have HBO or whatever. Maybe we could host a private screening soon in one of the theaters here, invite our local law enforcement officers to watch it, and maybe have Ernie and Joe come in and do a Q and A. Uh, maybe, maybe that's something we could look into uh, through Mad Radio. Yeah, let me know. You know, bring in your local mental health authority, all your stakeholders. You know, yeah. the fire department, paramedics. I mean, we're all responding to the same yep. call. So, yep. great idea. We've done that. You know, with the film festival. You know, we traveled all over the United States for two years now, and you know, the response has always been positive. Even in New York, John is positive. <laughs> uh, you know, and you I'm got a, great offices in New York. And I even I said you. I was a Red Sox fan, man. I almost almost <laughs> messed it up, man. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> These guys. Yeah, right, these guys. Two, there's a couple them, of right? things in New York. Don't say you're a Red Sox fan. <laughs> don't say Chicago Pizza is better than New York. <laughs> and as soon as you say y'all, it that's it. That's it. They know they know where you're from. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, well, thank All you right. so much for uh, spending the time. I'm, I'm looking at the time right now. Yeah. This was fantastic uh, with us tonight. We for sure will will be in touch and and look forward to connecting y'all's message to a lot more departments uh, yes. in and around the Dallas area where where John and I are from because we we definitely recognize the need is there and just to just to view the film and be able to ask you questions. I, I mean, it's worth the, worth the time for sure. Yes. Well, thank you for what y'all right. are doing and continuing the conversation. I'm totally indebted to you. Thank you for thank your Thank you, Ernie. Appreciate it. Tell thank Joe you. I said hello. <laughs> Will do. All right. Take All right. care. Take Bye -bye. care. Wow. 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 What an incredible show. This was such a, an impactful and incredible show. Ernie, I mean, he just breaks it down to be real, uh, tells it like it is, uh, you know, Ernie and Joe, the film.com for more information. Let's not let this, you know, go on. It doesn't have to go on anymore. There, there's, uh, help, um, from the people that walk the walk and talk the talk. They've been there, right. done that. Um, and, and to everybody listening, you know, you're not alone in your in your own mental health and mental wellness journey. Uh, these guys are are here for you as well. And you know, speaking of guys being there for you, as I scroll through the uh, where's our where's our thing, I'm getting used to using this. Here we go. Multitask. There yes. Go. So, okay. um, yeah, I, I always tell people I can't type and talk. Apparently I can't even push a button <laughs> on the mouse and talk. Um, a badge of honor.com. It's what John and I do. It's our passion with Jeff and John Edmondson. We can come into your department, uh, PTS and suicide awareness for your officers upcoming workshop Friday, April 23rd. 0800 to 1600, eight hours of T-Cole uh, is available for that course. And uh, just like Ernie said, we're gonna tell you our stories, but we're not the experts. And that's why we have experts uh, to deal with the specific mental health um, right. issues that like know what all the words mean, the big long words because they got letters behind their name. <laughs> um, that's what they do. And it's just an honor and a pleasure to be able to come together to deliver that in a, an eight hour uh, for right now, because we know we're going to go a lot bigger than, than this, uh, hopefully next year, but in an eight hour um, platform that's, that will allow uh, um, a lot of folks to attend. So if you want to come, it's in Rowlett, Texas. Go to a abadgeofhonor.com. It's right there on the screen. And uh, you can register for the workshop. The link is right there. And if you are looking to support us, you can now do that because we are a Texas nonprofit. That's right. <laughs> so um, I have to actually still post this certificate, the picture of the certificate. So if you go on to a badge of honor .com, 
you'll see the donate button under the mad radio tab. We're going to be doing some moving stuff around with the website, but right now you click there, you can donate all of the money goes to putting on these workshops. hundred percent goes to the, the workshops to take care of our first responders out there so they can be the best officers they can for themselves, uh, best first responders for themselves, for their family members, and ultimately for their community. And if you want to uh, support Mad Radio in kind of a unique way, it, it's, uh, at least I've been told, it's the most unique way. Now, now, with what's going on craziness, <laughs> get your Texas license to carry. Right here is the website, carryintexas.com. Yep. Get your Texas license to carry, folks. You got to protect yourself because we got some stuff coming out of D.C. that's just making everybody go, like like the meme, huh? <laughs> you know? Hey, get your license, be prepared, and, and it'll all be good. And that's also how you uh, support the show. And just want everybody to know that you are absolutely not alone in your journey, that we are always here at a badge of honor and mad radio. We've got your back and so appreciative every week to our audience that continuously tunes in. Hey, if you're listening on YouTube, thank you so much. Jump on over to our Facebook page uh, you know, get connected with us there. And if you're watching on Facebook on the, either the mad radio channel or the badge of honor, a badge of honor channel, do us a huge jump on over to our YouTube channel, which is at mad radio, Texas and follow us over there. The more followers we have, or as YouTube calls them subscribers, we're not selling you magazines we get to do more cool things with the YouTube platform. So please, uh, we're, we're asking you to, to do that, to help support, um, to all the first responders, everybody on the front lines, all of our folks at the border. We love you. We're praying for you every single day, John, take us home. And then I'll play the video of our partners. You know, uh, I, I, I can't I can't top what Ernie said, but you know what? I posted it today on my Facebook and uh, I stand by it as we have to make our own mental health a priority. So God bless everybody. Today is not the day to give up. Thank you, Sam. Amen. Till next week. All right. Mm -hmm.